Now, <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Catherine Asper to y'all. And most of y'all um, know her, have heard her speak, especially if you've been at past Union Odysseys. Two years ago, we got to hear her speak on Frida Kahlo, a psychotherapeutic look at her art. Last year, we were pleased to hear her speak about um, Hephaestus and what it means to have a child born with a handicap. And this year, she's going to speak about Segantini, the artist. I'm sure most of you have also read her books, um, especially the, the Inner Child in Dreams and the Abandoned Child Within. And if you haven't read them, you really need to, because they're great. So I, <laughs> so I am pleased and proud to introduce Catherine Asper as she speaks today on Giovanni Segantini, Darkness, Yearning, Creative Fulfillment. Katie for this generous introduction. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Is it okay? Perfect. <laughs> Otherwise, you just raise your hand. I will not ask you a question. Just that I know that you can hear me. It's a rainy day today, and we're here today for a walk through a series of paintings of Giovanni Segantini. Giovanni Segantini painted up here in the Engadin during many years and the title I have chosen is Giovanni Segantini Darkness Yearning Creative Fulfillment. The darkness points to the overshadowed beginning of his life. I will talk about that later. And then the yearning. His whole life was motivated by a deep and fervent yearning for beauty, for the modern, and based on a tremendous the energy to, for sublimation and trying to find the divine in nature. And then naturally this came to really a creative fulfillment. When I was a child, you saw nearly in many bourgeois households you saw second TV paintings in schools, in hospitals, everywhere there were second TV paintings. And we must know that Segantini was a world famous painter and really the best paint, 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 painter in his time, imagine. And this is due to the new technique that was found to reproduce, for reproduction. You, know, you could buy his art and really hang it up uh, in your sitting room. And then, when I grew older, Segantini uh, was forgotten and people thought it was a little bit teach, it's a little bit uh, you know, old fashioned and so on. <coughs> But as I have spent five years in the Engadin, in a boarding school, uh, Segantini is very close to me. And, you know, the sky here, you will see when you have sunny days. The sky, the blue of the sky is different here. It's an absolutely different blue of the sky. And so I have a deep love for the Engadin. And so I really recovered also my being taken by the work of Giovanni Segantini. I show you as an introduction and give you an impression the first painting I would like to show you. 
than you should have written a beauty. This is a very famous <coughs> beauty. It's Hail Mary during passage. In his earlier days, he painted it in a dark color. Later, he reworked it at the age of 30. The motive is mother with her child and her husband, who holds the bark crowded with sheep hovens. This reminds, inevitably, to the holy <coughs> family particularly in the persons pausing in silent worship and the scene being arched in black lightning from the shining yellow radiating crown of the setting sun. So here you see really typically Giovanni Zegantini's message. The ordinary is seen, is raised to the sacred, always. You can, this you could see in really many, many households. And Segantini died in 1899 at the age of 41, so very young. And it's very interesting that already the early psychoanalytic movement was drawn to Segantini. Karl Abraham, the psychoanalyst in Berlin, wrote a study on Segantini, Giovanni Segantini, ein psychoanalytischer Versuch a psychoanalytic approach, and it's very interesting what he has already to say in the early 20th century. Jung was born in 1875, so Segantini was roughly 20 years older, but it's also the time of symbolism, nature symbolism, the spiritual and the transcendent. The main themes of this morning are loss, abandonment, yearning and the sacred realm. You will see that the role of the modern archetype is strongly constellated in his life and work. Not also as a theme of loss, but a theme of fervent journey. My intention is to acquaint you with Giovanni Segantini's work, to open a window to take you for a stroll through the series of his paintings. And I really hope you visit the Segantini Museum in San Moritz on Wednesday. I start with his testament, his last three paintings, which you will see in the Segantini Museum in San Moritz. It's a triptych, three monumental, colossal paintings in the style of his time. They are about three to two meters in format, so colossal. And they talk about or display about where we come from, who we are, and where we go to. The triptych was meant to be exposed at the World Exhibit in Paris in 1900. He called it himself Life, Nature and Death.
The three paintings count amongst the monumental pieces of art which are very typical for the time of the ending of the 19th century. It was a time where technique and science had its triumphs and where people without questioning believed in it. The world was geographically discovered up to the north pole and down to the south pole. As I said, the triptych was planned for the world exhibit in Paris in 1900. However, Segantini died when he was finishing the middle part, being in fall 1899. He died due to an acute illness, peritonitis, a Bauchfellentzündung, which made it impossible to bring him down from the mountain hut where he lived in order to paint from the original nature. So this monumental painting has become his artistic testament. It talks about his belief in the spiritual aspect of nature and the triptych, like an altar, contains a spiritual message. The central sun in the middle part shines as a spirit of nature also over the side parts, life and death. In order to heighten the spiritual message, Segantini had in mind to create basics, lunettes, Above the paintings and the flames were meant to be composed by him with equally symbolic wood carvings. In a letter in the year of his death, 1899, Segantini talks of the spirit of nature, of life and death. Fourteen years, he says, have now passed that I came to the high mountains and there I searched the harmony of nature and I searched for a harmony of colors and sounds and all these different harmonies harmonies of the high mountains, I wanted to unite them in one perfect synthesis. Then he goes on to say that the triptych contains all the beauties of the Engadin, the beautiful forms, the beautiful emotions, the deeply felt feelings, the beautiful lines, and show the divine spirit of nature. And then he says, I bow down in front of this beauty. I kiss the glass and the flowers under this blue arc of the sky. The birds are singing and become a couple when in their flight. I see the bees, how they drink the honey from the flowers. I myself drink from these pure sources where beauty renews itself eternally. So here we can see his love for nature and what he searches. He searches the cyclical, he searches continuity, he searches a container for his life and it is a yearning to be united with the divine spirit that is in nature. 
Such paintings, where we come from, who we are, where we go to, was really <coughs> typical for the time. I just remind you of Gauguin's triptych, three paintings, he called them, where do we come from, who are we, where do we go to. It is in the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. Gauguin and Segantini, two exponents of the end of the 19th century. Gauguin, the depressed, poor painter in Tahiti, searching for paradise there, and Segantini, the internationally known painter, living up here in the Engadin. Now I show you the first painting of the triptych. Could we have the next painting? This is called La Vita Life. This is the monumental painting. It's taken from Solio, from the mountains behind Solio in the Bergen. And it's interesting where we come from. You would expect a sunrise. It is a sunset. Women are coming down the stairs, going to the pond, and the direction is from the right to the left. It's late afternoon, the sun extends its last beams to the mountains, and the moon reflects itself in the waters. Men and animals recede, nature prevails. The painting depicts, according to Segantini's own words, the life of all things which have its roots in Mother Earth. And you see the direction from the left to the right. And you see a mother with child sitting on the roots of a tree. And we also see a big hole in the roots. So men in this painting step down from the celestial light into the darkness of the night into everyday life. That is the message of this being. And we see to the right the dominant role of the model in Segantini's work. And he says, love and respect and honor the woman, the mothers, because they give us life and give us love. And this mother with child is like a Madonna with child. But it is ambivalent, you see it. It's an ambivalent symbolism of the roots. Life is rooted in the earth, but this whole points to uprootedness and is symbolized by the late open roots the tree, like the tree of life, is an axis between earth and sky. And a hole in the roots, in medieval iconography, was the entrance to hell. So that is also in this painting. And the basil, the lunette, that was meant to be above the painting. There he wanted to paint a figure as an allegory of the wind. And the wind sends the two elements which give life and death to the earth. Fire symbolized by a figure that throws lightnings and a cloud 
that gives way life. In this scene that was meant to be above this, death takes the soul of an unborn child and with this he meant to symbolize that even prenatal life can bear death. So death is inherent in the cyclical process of life. Navita, life, this painting, does not only symbolize the beginning of life on earth, the descent into life, but also the separation from the transpersonal, the numinous sphere. Could we have the next painting? This is the central painting. It is painted from the highest point Sagantini ever chose, namely the Schafberg, a panorama of the Engadin. Sky is more than half of the painting. Peasants will walk their cattle home. It's a difficult path on earth, but they walk towards the light. Again, it's very really interesting. It's not due time, it's sunset. For Segantini, the life circle makes sense only through its relation to the numinous. And then we see the last painting, can we have the next? This is La Morte Death. Death of all things, women in mourning are waiting for a stretcher which is carried from the house. Here to the right. We are waiting for the stretcher. You see the stretcher is coming out of the door and they are waiting in mourning. According to Secantini, the linen covers a girl. One does not see a church or a cemetery or a lined out pass to where they have to go. But the direction of the vehicle is certain. It is towards the illuminated sky. And the basin that was meant to be painted afterwards show two angels who carry the soul of the dead. So for Secantini, death is in a way rebirth. You are contained in the cyclical life of nature. Secantini's answer to the questions, where do we come from, who are we, and where are we going is the totality of life, nature, man, animals, is embedded in the cyclical character of the cosmos. Man comes from the numinous sphere into this world, into the here and now, where he has to meet the difficulties of life until he can go back to the light, to the spirit, in the other world. This program of, and the testament of Segatini has many parallels to Romanticism. For the Romantics, nature always bore the spirit of the divine. I remember you to Caspar David Friedrich, who said the divine is everywhere, also in the grain of sand. I remind you to Novalis, to Wackenröder, Philipp Otto Rome, 
and so on. Religion is nature, and nature is religion. And also very interesting, nature feels the gap that church has left. Nature feels the gap that church has left. And if we think of you, evil and the feminine in his work and his path filled the gap church has left. So in a way, Segantini fulfilled the romantic program of all the authors and painters who searched for the divine in nature. And I just remind you, something you all know, that also Jung's Weltbild and his awareness is deeply rooted in the Romantic period. We have the next painting. This painting is called Religious Solace, Glaubenstrost. The picture shows two deeply moved mourning parents besides the fresh grave of their child. And, oh, sorry, sorry, these are the basins. These were meant to be each one above one of the painting of the triptych. I just wanted to show it. They, he never finished them. We only have the sketches. So the next piece. <laughs> so this is religious solace that the Romans toast. Here you have a painted basin. And the scene is the child has died and you see two deeply moved mourning parents besides the fresh grave of the child in a cemetery screened off by a wall and a gateway. So again, you here see a scene and like with the other pictures. Secantini's paintings, you just have to look at them, take the beauty within into your heart. And Secantini does not call in a way for really learned uh, theory and interpretations. You immediately get it, what he wants to say. He wants to say there is some solace, there is consolation after death. You see in the basil the two angels that carry away the unclosed girl that carry her to another world. The despair of the sudden loss stands in opposition to the consolation of the heavenly blessedness. of the clouds, but the little trees are of a deep green, they already come out of the snow and they really give hope. It's in nature, the hope is in nature in the little uh, pine trees. Segantini, and I have here also a quote uh, where he talks about his relationship to God. Never did I search a God outside of myself. I was convinced 
that God is within you. That every person's person carries a little piece of God within you. That is his belief. He wasn't uh, included in the confessional church, but God was for him in nature. Now I would like to take you for a glimpse on his biography. You can put out the light. Secantini was born in 1858 in the northern part of Italy, the northern end of the lake of Garden. <laughs> So in a way, as Christina Zielinski always points out, Segantini is a replacement child. After his birth, the mother was sickly and never recovered and died when he was six. And he says, in my memory, I carry my mother. And I see her with my inner eye. I see her with the eyes of the spirit. This high figure, tall figure. She's tired. She was beautiful. Back to <laughs> Sorry. <clears throat> there is another one. Should be fine. Should be fine. Is uh, fine? Yeah. Okay. She was tired, but she was beautiful. <coughs> she was not beautiful like dawn or noon, but like sunset in spring. Yeah, that was her life. She died in the spring of her life and the sunset plays a big role in his paintings. So already darkness was at the beginning of his life. The father was 20 years older than Giovanni's mother and had been married twice before. After the death of the mother, the father moved to Mailand with Giovanni, where a daughter and a son from his first married, marriage lived. The son had a kind of a drugstore and the daughter helped in the household. But soon the business failed and had to be given up. Father and son left and were never seen again and Giovanni was given to the care of his stepsister. And here, he says, began my personal life that I, only I, owned. It was full of joys, but also full of pain, but never boring. And never did pain and mourning succeed in making me totally unhappy. So he continued living with his stepsister who left the house in the morning and he was all alone in this room under the roof and the stepsister came home in the evening. I stayed there totally alone and was often in the grip of fears. Sometimes I left the room and went to a great window in the staircase from which I watched what was going on in the courtyard. I waited and longed for my father, but I never have never seen him again. I suffered 
but did not know it was pain. One day I had some paper. I began to tear it up in small pieces and I threw them like snowflakes down to the courtyard. An angry man came and brutally hit me on my behind. From then on, my sister locked me in in our rooms before leaving the work. That was his life. It was so full of fears and darkness that one day he fled. So he fled and was <coughs> taken in by a couple of peasants and they let him tend the Schwarzwein for about six weeks and then he was brought home. So he made out of this a hero story. You know? <laughs> he said, I fled, I was taken in, uh, had to tend the swine and a neighbor said, oh, this young boy, he looks like a descendant of an aristocrat. And so he made up a family normal. You know? <laughs> so, uh, so it's a hero story, like Moses, who was taken, uh, found again. That was his hero story. Then he came back to Mailand and lived like a street child and was then going to, for a short while, to an art school and married then very young Bija Bugatti. Had four children, three sons, and his son Gotardo also became an artist. He moved with his wife to the rural area in northern or north of Mailand, where he found the beloved aspects of nature. As he remembered nature of his early childhood when his mother still was alive and when the family <coughs> lived there. This period lasted for three years. <coughs> then he moved higher and higher. First he moved to Savonin in the Grisons also. It's nearby, not a valley. <coughs> From the hills, I went to the mountains and I mingled with the farmers, with the shepherds, and then I went to the Alps. I studied men, animals, the landscape, earth, went in all the valleys of the Grisons. Here I stayed eight years. But Many or most of my days I spent high up in the mountains. So we can say, uh, yeah, Giovanni was so much taken by the modern and searched for the modern also in nature. But he was a hard working man, so he really had a masculine uh, drive in his, in, him, in his person. So he usually got up at four o'clock in the morning walked for two, three hours up to the mountains, had a little hat there and started to paint for eight, nine hours. Slept in this hut and came back. So you ask, how could he paint high up in the mountains? How could he carry this monumental paintings? So he was very inventive. He had a cupboard manufactured up in the mountains where he could put the painting in the evening and lock it and so really had a shelter for the painting so that it would be snowed on, the rain could be destroyed. That's how his work was effectuated. Now I would just like to show you a series of paintings. They speak for themselves. Can we have the next painting? <coughs> That's an early painting, and uh, it's a landscape with 
woman with an inner tree. So you see, woman, tree, is often the scene. We saw it in the first painting, Life, where the modern child sat on the wounds. Here, the women sit in a tree. <coughs> Keep that in mind, woman and tree that will appear quite often in the next paintings. Then the next painting, please. Just to show a knitting girl at the fence. <coughs> Giovanni Segantini had only one model, that was Baba. She worked in the household of the family uh, Segantini and she was his only model. He never had an affair with the model. He was strictly monogamous, he was really close to his wife, but Baba nearly appears on all his paintings. And when he painted, his wife sat close to him and read him, <laughs> read him poems and read him stories and talked to him. Really <laughs> idyllic family life. <laughs> Next painting, it's a girl at the spring in the native costume of the Engadin. So drinking at the spring has a highly symbolic meaning as we have already heard. And you don't see a horizon, it's very closely framed this painting and you see this girl drinking water. Water is really being nurtured by nature, it means. Then the next painting, it's new in the Alps. You see here Baba, the model, and it's a high alpine landscape. See the old still snow-covered mountains. The young shepherdess stands up straight in her blue work dress. She holds the cook in her left hand. And the other hand is at the brim of her straw hat. The light breeze in which the two birds flutter in the radiant blue sky give the painting the original title, title Windy Day. Then the next painting, please. This is called The Two Models. You see the, the cow and the calf sleeps and on the other side you see the model that lots of with the child in a stable. I think for you who are so symbolically trained this painting speaks for itself. <coughs> Modern and child and the bones of the stable. The next painting, please. That's high up in the mountains again. Cows at the water drum. Again, this painting <laughs> speaks that man and animals are absorbed by nature. And a person drinking water, again from the water source, it doesn't need any more explanation. Then the next painting, please. It's afternoon in the Alps, Again, 
woman leaning at a birch tree. <coughs> woman and tree. It is an ongoing motive in his book. Next, please. This is hay harvest. And you see the horizon is very low. In the sky you also see the dark clouds. The woman is bent over in the center of this picture. And the real contour of the haymaker exactly covers the horizon. This quite normal scene changes to a symbolic representation, to a symbol of human existence. Work in the Alps takes place under the sky that is both gentle and ominous, carries forth the darkness and the light. The peaceful evening atmosphere is overshadowed and threatened by gathering dark clouds. Despite the harsh work, Zigantini portrays an earthy paradise which is alone endangered by celestial and controllable powers such as the force of nature. And the next painting is again of this type, return from the woods. The tree light and the white of the snow evoke a bitterly cold winter evening. The frost cold is even more emphasized by the warm illuminated windows of the distant houses of the mountain village. It is, this painting, an allegory for the impoverished existence of the mountain peasants and their survival during the hard winter. At the same time, it is symbolic of death itself. The snow has piled up in great drifts on mountains, meadows, and rooftops and exposed the woman to an unending desolateness and loneliness. Now we come to a totally other uh, theme. We talked about the modern nature, the divine, in its really positive and beautiful aspect. Now we see the other side. We see the negative model. We see Salvani Zagantini's rage, his disrespect for whom. Giovanni, in his letters, often says that he feels guilty for the death of his mother, because after his birth she was sickly and then died soon after. So that was a tremendous guilt feeling throughout his life. And the origin of his lifelong search for mother and in a in the sublimation for the search of modern in nature and the cyclical process of nature. But he also carried rage against his mother. Can we see the next painting? <coughs> Don't be shocked. <coughs> it is the punishment of the voluptuous women. You see two women floating on snow and ice in the air. 
and the red hair is entangled in the birch tree of the womb to the right. The source was a Buddhist legend of the 12th century, translated by a certain Luigi Ilya, but it was a poor invention. Giovanni Segantini knew it. The true source of Ilya was a poem of a French author, The Birth of Purgatory. So it is not the birth of hell, it's the birth of the pre hell of purgatory, purgatory. Women float above snow in the icy landscape. And it is said, these are women who did not want to give their breast to their babies. That's the greatest sin. A mother who does not nurture and care for the child. For all these women, purgatory, not hell, meant punishment and with purgatory there is always redemption. It means also finally redemption. In the back you see two women who have their baby and give the breast to their babies. Well, that is really an expression and a symbolic expression for the negative model and could really be rooted also in Segantini's psyche. A version of this painting you see also in the Kunsthaus Zurich. It displays a more dreamlike character. It's a light, its light is moonlight. It is an imaginary, timeless landscape, poorly symbolic. It carries the quality of a totally inner world, this expression of a psychic reality. Can we have the next painting? Here you see a detail, and now the next. Next. Here is the Zurich version. You see, it's totally inside. A psychic uh, expression of the psychic <coughs> situation. <coughs> the yearning for the model and the memory of her as a beautiful, nurturing model are replaced by hatred. hatred, and we witness the psychic reality of the negative cape model. <coughs> the model who denies life, does not nurture it, kills it even, <coughs> displays coldness and freezes all warm feelings. We find here Segantini's experience of model loss, bereavement, the lack of nurture, care, and warmth he experienced after his mother's death. Karl Acker Abraham, in his study of Segantini, psychoanalytic uh, study of Segantini, says that in Segantini's case, the development of the libido got arrested and the two drives, love and hatred, could never merge and find a balance. He calls Segantini a dual neurotic <coughs> who could not get to terms with the dark side of existent, existence and could not heal the still separate drives of hatred and love. We remember that Melanie Klein calls these two drives to have not merged the schizoid position, <coughs> hatred and love, in really separate drives. That is what 
Count Adler says to Segantini, uh, uh, says this is also the cause for his swinging moods, because it is known that Segantini suffered from periods of melancholy and depression. From a Jungian perspective, I see this differently. Early abandonment, in his case, loss of the mother and an absent father, and many deficits of all sorts concerning nurture, marked Secantini and constellated the dark side of existence early on. And this was the base for his depression, depressive moods and the yearning to unite with beauty, the model and nature. I would not call him a neurotic unless we are all neurotic. We all have suffered deficits and have to balance them out and sometimes in strange neurotic ways, that is clear. But I wouldn't call him in such sharp terms as um, Abraham uh, calls him a uh, heavy neurotic. But see in uh, Zegantini a person whose life was tragically marked by early traumas, which of course left their imprint in his soul. But there was also a strong <laughs> final drive and intention in his psyche. The intention to search for what was lost, to search for the model, and to transcend this search for the personal model in a symbolic way, coupled with an outstanding <coughs> talent and the firm will to make his way. Not only did Segantini survive, he found healing in nature and in his family. In the tremendous success of his art, in my eyes he lived a full life and I could not say his life was neurotically limited, but there was the modern archetype that guided his life and the yearning that really was the deepest intention of his life. And this really, you know, ended in a way in the creative fulfillment of his life. Now we see the second uh, of these negative paintings. It is called The Bad Women. Can we see the next painting? It's no? Woman in a tree and uh, the child appears and the child finds the breast, but the woman turns the head away. And to the left, very much to the left, you can't see it so clearly, you see a child's head breaking through the ice and tries to pull itself out of the cold by means of the roots of the trees. The scarlet color touch of the flesh because of the cold, her twisted body posture, her entangled hair in the dead birch tree show her torture. And there are two models in the back. You can't really clearly see them. They are companions of the one in the center. 
And again, of this painting, there exists a more symbolic uh, graffiti painting version in the Kunsthaus in Zurich. Now we come to the last period of his life, where Segantini really moved to symbolism, very much to the symbolic representations of every day life. I mean, this was already symbolic, but he made a move to an even more symbolic page style of painting. Can we see the next painting? This is called... Oh, this is the detail. This is the detail. Next painting. The symbolic. Vanity at the source of evil. You see a naked woman with red hair at the grotto, a pond that reflects her, not with her own mirrored image, but with a dragon-like monster. She sees a dragon-like monster reflected. As Jung said, who looks into the mirror of the water does not see himself but his shadow. <coughs> So, in contrast to many paintings of his time, uh, Segantini does not paint here the triumph of female beauty, but the negative side. And then we see a more positive painting, also a symbolic painting, Love at the Source of Life. It's again a symbolic painting where you see to the right an angel and one wing is white and one is dark and grey and you see a young man and a young woman and Shigantini writes about this painting I send you the photo of my recent painting it shows the serene and carefree love of a woman and the pensive one of the man they relate to each other their use and through, their sp through springtime. The pass is small, grooving with alpine roses on each side. The couple is dressed in white, symbolizing lilies. Eternal love, say the alpine roses. Eternal hope, answer the evergreen trees. A mystical angel in suspicious attitude stretches its big wing over the source of life. Living waters are bubbling from the rocks, pours symbols of eternity. So it is the dark and the white wing of the angel that uh, is in the background or, yeah, is omnipresent in the life. So Giovanni Segantini expresses the eternal dualism between hope, peace, and misfortune. And now we come to the last painting that people call a masterpiece. It's the Angel of Life, again, uh, <coughs> model raised in a way to the sacred as an angel with the child. And it's reality and allegory. It's a wonderful enmeshment or marriage between the reality of the landscape and the symbolic visionary angel and child figure sitting in the tree. As if our eyes would on a cold winter day see the apparition of the virgin and the child, it is the landscape of here, of sales. And the perspective allows to paint 
with the tree a sort of stage. And the source is a medieval painting, the Madonna in the dry tree of Petrus Christus of the 15th century, a motive which was highly known in 17th time. And with this painting, I would like to end. It was painted three years before his death. Segantini continued to paint till 1899, then fell ill, high up in the Alps. But before he about 10 days before his death, he had a dream where he lost his way in the snow and just was cold and he just wanted to die. And his mother appeared and shook him and said to him, go on. And he did. But then he went high up to paint the second painting of the triptych, finish it noon, and he attracted uh, peritonitis and uh, died. But he did not want to see a doctor. Then he forbid his son to, to call for the doctor and died and his last words were uh, I want to see my mountains and I would agree with Abraham it seems convincing that the primordial love for the mother which he experienced as fulfilling and the deception of her death are at the root of Giovanni Segantini's changing moods between melancholy and happiness. This made him live and made him die. Thank you for your attention. shocking for me when you first showed them. I hadn't seen those. Yeah. And I thought, wow, people had those in their living rooms. Yeah. <laughs> Especially the one on the, the, the passage, you know, the, this wonderful Hail Mary, Mary during passage, the boat with the Holy Family, and yeah. the sheep and the peaceful sunset. That you could see them. But not the tortures. No, the torture you would never see, yeah. of course. <laughs> I discovered them much later. No, the torture women or the bad women you would never see. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I still uh, don't understand exactly how the trip 
hectic was achieved if he felt ill while doing the second But you know, uh, uh, Giovanni Segantini had a really uh, special kind of painting. It was a very continuous painting. He never mixed the colors. So carefully he put green and then red, or gold, or white. One stroke between the other. So it was a tremendous work to do his paintings and to have a this door. So he worked for years on his paintings. More or less, all three were finished, but not to his expectation. You know. And the basins have not been done, and the wood carvings, the frames have not been done. That's how it explains. Yes. It just seems a, a little contradictory. He must have been, on one hand, a, a very prolific painter for him to be in sanitariums, hospitals, and people's homes. So, uh, but this, these were entirely his work. There was no lithography involved. He was just a tremendously you know, prolific guy. Yeah. I didn't hear you. Um, the, the, the number, you said he, he took so much time uh, yeah. with these ap applications of uh, brush strokes and the size of the painting seemed to be quite impressive, you were saying. So, but yet you had earlier said and repeated yourself that um, he was in many bourgeois homes, he was in many uh, mm -hmm. hospitals and public buildings. It just seemed he must have been painting constantly. Yeah, he was, was painting constantly. He was painting eight to nine hours a day, constantly. Hard working, maybe also, as you see in depressive people, that they, they calm uh, the depression, they obtain the depression by endlessly work, working endlessly. Yeah. The other thing that impressed me greatly was that uh, it, he seemed to be such a flexible painter in that it, the subject was, uh, and, the, and the symbolism involved was the most important thing. But I saw many different styles, from kind of most photorealistic to early romantic to, uh, uh, to uh, even with, with the women floating, almost kind of a, uh, at, the, at that time, I think it was Klimt in Austria. Um, so there, yeah. yeah. So they just seemed, he seemed to be uh, tremendously flexible, depending on uh, what he was trying to create. He was a really great painter, I would say, and this. I mean, he, he died at the age of 41. Imagine, and he, he, he came out of his own. He had no support from nobody. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite impressive. But I think we need a break to prepare us for this meeting lecture. <laughs> <coughs> the Jungian Odyssey and the fourth to be held uh, since it was founded more or less simultaneously with the founding of the International School of Analytical Psychology in Zurich. Uh, the concept of the Jungian Odyssey is to bring together a group of 15 or 20 uh, senior analysts and lecturers, teachers from, uh, from the International School take them out into the country somewhere for a week and bring together an audience from around the world and put these two groups of people together and see what happens. It's a, it's a journey, uh, therefore it's called the Odyssey. And uh, each one, each Odyssey is a little different because the personalities are different and the location is different. Uh, each time the Odyssey is set in a different landscape, a different part of Switzerland. Uh, this year we are in the Upper Engadine, as it's called, uh, a very unusual canton in Switzerland. Uh, the native language here is uh, an, an unusual one. It's a descendant of Old Latin. Uh, it's the fourth language of the Swiss. Uh, we have German, French, Italian, and this 
version of Old Latin. Um, the uh, setting that we're in, the Waldhaus, is a hotel that is uh, about uh, 102 years old. They celebrated their 100th anniversary a couple of years ago. And it's a, a place that Jung visited twice with his wife, Emma. Um, they stayed in a room here in 1917 and again in 1926. So we feel that we're in a very privileged location this year. This is the fourth, as I said, the fourth Odyssey. And uh, I feel it's uh, so far we've had uh, two or three days of it. Uh, it's a very rich, very full and exciting experience. Lots of good energy. Uh, the weather is improving and when the weather gets good here, this is a magical country. We're deep in the mountains of Switzerland, uh, near one of the famous ski resorts, San Moritz. And uh, the, uh, the landscape is absolutely magnificent. This is also location famous for uh, it's uh, having uh, housed the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche uh, during a period of his life when he was writing his famous work, Zarathustra. The Odyssey is organized by a small committee of very dedicated people. Uh, they've done this now for the fourth time, and they've really gotten uh, down to a fine art. Um, Stacy Viert, uh, who is also one of the officers in the uh, uh, International School, um, Isabel Meyer and uh, John Hill are the most active members of that committee. And they put together these programs each year. They invite a couple of special guests from the outside. Uh, this year we're very happy to have Paul Bishop, the uh, professor of German literature, uh, and from Scotland and from Glasgow. And uh, he has given us a couple of lectures, one on Nietzsche and Jung, one on Goethe and Jung. Um, and uh, it's very, very interesting material. And uh, later in the week, David Tacey will be here from Australia. So we have people coming from the outside as well as insiders, our, our own training analysts, lecturing here. I'd say the quality of the lectures and the seminars here is, is very high, uh, but it's also an uh, opportunity for people to begin immersing themselves in Jungian psychology. You don't have to know a lot to get a lot out of these lectures and these experiences. Plus, you meet people from all over the world, and there's a certain amount of bonding that takes place here. A community forms in the course of a week. You eat three meals a day together. Uh, you have free time together. There are excursions and uh, other events besides the lectures and uh, the formal uh, meetings. And so it's really a, a very spirited atmosphere uh, and generative of a lot of new futures that come out of this. People make important decisions uh, as a result of these kinds of experiences. Uh, sometimes they decide to spend more time in Zurich and they come and study at uh, the International School or they go home and they make some important changes in their lives. Uh, it's, a, it's that kind of an odyssey. It might be a part of an ongoing odyssey in an individual's life or it may be the starting point for a new stage of a person's life journey. Uh, what we're focused on is personal development, uh, a deepening of the inner life, uh, spiritual life, psychological understanding and insight, and gaining awareness of what's going on in the world around us and what's going on in the world within us. So I would like to invite the audience watching this to uh, look into coming sometime to participate in an, audi uh, in an odyssey uh, or come to Zurich and study with us at the International School. Thank you. We're, we're here at the Wald House now with our fourth Odyssey. And a lot of people have been asking me about how the Odyssey got started. And I think, John, you know best because I wasn't part of the original committee. Yeah. You were. 
That's true, Stacy. That's right. So really, in some way, it grew out of the conflict between the two institutes. You know, we were all previously at the Jung Institute, and there was a, a, a huge conflict about leadership, about how it's managed. I don't want to go into it too much detail. Um, and then 2004, ESAP, if I remember correctly, what began, and we thought of having a summer intensive in 2005, but we gradually realized, starting from scratch, it was so difficult, it was so difficult. So, uh, first of all, a lady called Cedrus Monte decided to take on that task, and then came a discussion about what kind of summer conference. <coughs> now, I had a lot of experience with Jung in Ireland, that's led by Arya Maidenbaum, so I had a completely different idea of maybe how a summer conference should be organized. So on that model, I proposed, first of all, coming from a very solid institute, the C.G. Jung Institute, I thought maybe we'll become a bit too complacent, it was a bit too easy, we had too many clients, too many students, so maybe we've been kind of set adrift. And when I realized that, and thought of the War of Troy, well, why not have an odyssey? Why not see Jungian psychology in terms of movement? Rather than being fixed at a place, we have our little house there at Isa, but let's try to get a hold of Jungian psychology as movement. And then came the idea of finding some place, a hotel, uh, located in an area that is in some way connected with Jung. So the idea of movement, of landscape, and some way connected with Jungian psychology. And so it's a bit like an odyssey. There's, a, there's an Irish odyssey of going from island to island and it seems almost like every island represented a facet of human existence. In Jungian psychology, we talk about an archetype. And so the first place that I, together with Cedrus, um, suggested was Flüeli Ranft. It's right in the center of Switzerland. And it's the home place of the patron saint in Switzerland. Bruder Kranz. Bruder Kranz, that's Actually, right, yeah. yes. And um, because we were adrift, because we were not sure where we're going, it's a place which has a very vertical accent. You go up or you go down. Mm -hmm. And as people know, Bruder Klaus uh, lived in a hermitage down in the gorge. And um, became well known in Switzerland. First of all, for 20 years he never ate or drank. Now, we didn't quite do that at the Odyssey, but we had a lovely hotel in Pax Montana. Um, and then, uh, so people could sort of go down to the hermitage, meditate, and then come up onto the uh, hillside, and then we had the conference there. So it was very much the whole going up and down. And I felt that was a good start because we needed to start from all the turmoil and chaos. Maybe we just needed to orientate ourselves spiritually on this vertical axis. And so began the Odyssey. And do you want to say what the connection of it is to ISAP? Well, um, yes. Is it an independent No, 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 no. It's held at the end of the summer semester. Right. So it's actually included in the summer semester. And um, the point being is that gives the students the opportunity to also experience the Odyssey. And maybe also it opens its doors to people who are not only interested in a, a week in these lovely mountain retreats discussing Jungian psychology and goodness knows what, 
but also maybe to get to know ESAP, know the students, know the kind of curriculum we have there, the kind of training we have. So it's also a sort of invitation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that really was our first odyssey. The theme was, um, well, there were actually two themes which we didn't repeat because we thought it was too much. You mean psychology today, something like between tradition and innovation. And there was a second thing, which was, um, um, I think, the, the quest for meaning. No, it's not that. Uh, I just have to look that up. Uh, yes. Uh, um, it was um, quest for vision in a troubled world, exploring the healing dimensions of religious experience. I think that obviously grew out of our troubled world. And the connection with Buddha class, I guess. Yes, um, exactly. That Very place good, yes, lent yeah, itself yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah. So, you know, we set sail, and this was our first island after a pretty rough passage. You can imagine the organization where we just had to start from scratch. And then I was more or less uh, in charge of that in the second half. And because I'm an analyst and trying to write things and do everything else, God knows what else, I couldn't do it. It was too much. So then, after we had completed the first trip, <coughs> voyage of the Odyssey, an angel appeared on the horizon and says, I will do the work for you. I will do the administration. And that oh, is Isabel. Oh, yeah. John, you are so nice. <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't there at the first Odyssey, but then the second time that we were at um, at Gerza mm -hmm. near Rotu, I can remember, and it was directly at the lake, and uh, uh, it was formidable. It was great, so uh, good for our participants to go directly to the lake, the Lake of Lucerne, um, and we were there. And the title of the um, second Odyssey was. Um, the reality of the soul in a world of prescribed meanings and we had a lot of famous Jungian analysts there. I remember Jim Hollis right. were there yes. and Alan Buchenbühl and, and a lot of ISAP analysts also. Christopher Bamford was Christopher for, yeah, Bamford was also there. And uh, this second time um, I think we got uh, some experiences with, uh, with this conference, with this kind of conference. And so the next time, I think you can remember very well, was uh, at Beltenberg. Right. right. And then we produced our. Right. Uh, also, uh, by, by be the time of Beltenberg, and what was our theme then? Um, uh, intimacy. intimacy. Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, by, by the time we went to Battenberg, we had learned enough what kind of structures we need, how to run things, and that's when we decided it would be a good idea to try to publish the yeah. first Odyssey book. So we've done that with the title Intimacy, Venturing the Uncertainties of the Heart, brings together all the lectures, and I I can remember for me one of the special things about that place it was when we remember when we looked out the window of the hotel and the Iger Milk and you were just yeah. in our face, that's and, right. that's right. and that's where we felt this tremendous um, sense of closeness and distance, and how does that? affect yeah. us and our relationships. And the other really special thing we discovered there, the synchronicity, was that Paul, Paul Clay, the artist, had spent his summers there in his youth. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he had written in his journal as a 10-year-old, a 12-year-old, about his first passionate experience, mm -hmm. his unrequited oh, love. Yeah. And so okay. yeah, that helped lead into our Title II, and that was also the special chance that we had Noirini Ryan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm music. Yeah, yes, yeah. we had music, yes, that was true. Her voice sort of resounding in the yeah. mountainsides. Yeah. And we went and into also the caves. Also, the caves, it was yeah. singing in the caves. Yeah, huh? yes, yeah that's that's great experience. Because yeah. these are huge caves that go under the Alps near this place where we were. And <coughs> Noreen was a very famous Irish singer. Her voice then resounded from like the bottom of the earth. Yeah. It was yeah. almost like uh, 
Yeah. And, and she got everybody singing together. That's right, yeah. Okay. And we even discovered that this cave, what a dragon used to, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what, uh, who, who was the first? Say it now. I think it's Bell the dragon. Oh, yes. And he's Irish, isn't yeah. he? Yes. <laughs> That's right. Yes. Yes. I think, if I remember the date correctly, he was supposed to have been there around 500. Yeah. And. Ah, uh, of Jesus, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. And expelled the dragon and lived in those caves to his dying day. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Yeah. So we do try to find yeah. something that was like a legend or a story connected with the landscape right. mm -hmm. that connects with the unconscious. Right. And also the game of Loki, for that. That's right. Where, where Jung has also, I don't know if he, he, had, if he was at Gartenberg, but I think he was here in Walter. Yes. He was at well, what do you think about Norfolk? He, uh, he was definitely at the Pluto because and he wrote he was uh, Rudyard Klaus. Oh yes, he's, oh, he's oh. got a whole um, work uh, with, uh, you know, on Rudyard Klaus. And he was there and he said, if I remember correctly, somebody asked him a question, well, how did Rudyard Klaus survive 20 years without eating? And you yeah. wrote in a manuscript, he believed that this man could somehow take up the energies of the beautiful surroundings of nature. It's an and the most extraordinary thing about it is when they dug up his bones, uh, they found they were the bones of a 50-year-old man. And when he was 50, he stopped eating. He died when he was 70. So this is just like, it's a mystery. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But was most interested. As one mm -hmm. fans wrote a book about yeah. Peter Carlson. Mm -hmm. right. So a very Jungian theme as it were. And for the area of Gersau, we had um, notes from Jung about how his father used to take him ah, to the on the mountain. Ah, on the mountain. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. And it was when we, by the time we came here to Waldhaus, it was, we didn't know that Jung had stayed here, Jung and C.G. Jung, Jung and Emma stayed in room 221. Yeah. But we didn't know that when no. we came That's here. right. Yes, that we was, didn't. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Also, I mean, the Waldhaus is much famous. Who, who else was here, Isabel? Oh, Rainer Maria Rilke, Rilke and Thomas Rilke. Mann, and Hermann Hesse, and also Nietzsche, and the women. Huh? The, the women. women? Yes, oh. very good, Stacey, that's right. Yeah, right. Oh, Emma Jung, uh, but who else? Uh, Liu André Salome, who was very connected to yeah. Nietzsche and Rilke. Yeah. I think she even tried to get them involved in a Freudian analysis. But, uh, Really and we didn't mention that Nietzsche, the Nietzsche house is down the hill from here. That's so right, just, of course. Yeah. That's yeah. right, yes. That's past true, yes. We yeah. might guess that Jung was researching Nietzsche. I was trying to look at the dates. I'm so bad with dates, but he'd been working on the Zarathustra yeah. seminars. and In the 1920s, wasn't yeah. it? But I mean, I think he was here twice. Okay. Sometimes I think very early and then later. Okay. So, no doubt, yeah. no doubt. I mean, I'm sure. He visited the Nietzsche. I mean, knowing him, he must have visited yeah. Nietzsche. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think so as well. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me, Isabel, I just want, because you know, we, we have all these Jungians, these wonderful ideas about you know, vertical and sort of all these archetypal motives, visit to islands, venturing the other side, exploring the reality of soul. But you know, Isabel, you're the person who does a lot of the administration. And I've heard recently that, you know, people say, but the thing amazing about this conference is unions are rather impractical. And sometimes the organization is goes through. But this one so fluently, I mean, do you find it uh, easy or difficult to organize these conferences? This one or all of them? All of them. I mean, uh, how did you do it? I mean, you, get, you put all these different <laughs> strands together. I don't know. I think uh, I'm the oldest of five sisters, and perhaps it is that, like this. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know. It is in my blood or something like that. I mean, you seem to do it so easily without any, you know, because it's very yeah. you know, the nice hotels where we look after everyone. Yeah. Do they have the right room? Do they have the right bed? And all the lectures, and I mean, it's just... I don't know, but I have you and the committee and a lot of other people are helping, and it's the whole organization, and a lot of people help, and yeah, so... We that's that's try our best, and we go to a Although sometimes it's not easy, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. It sharpens up our inferior sensation. That's right. 
Yes, that's true. Yes, there's so much to do. Often, I mean, I burnt my hand on the teapot, and I think you also. I broke my hand. Yes, exactly. That's right. Our inferior sensate functions. Yeah. It does, but it does actually bring us down to earth, doesn't yeah. it? And just in the organizing mm -hmm. yeah. this mm -hmm. That's yeah. true. Yeah. Right. I wonder what we'd like to talk about next year. Don't you think that might be important? Yes. Uh, would you like to say something about that? Where, where is it going to be and what's the theme? Do you remember the theme? Yes, the, the theme is trust, trust and betrayal, dawnings of consciousness. Oh, yes. mm. And we'll be going back to Gersau, back to Hotel in the middle of It's in the middle of Switzerland. It's also an important thing, in the center of Switzerland. Mm. Um, and there's a beautiful yeah. lake, isn't it? Yeah. Mountains, and you see the, the Alps, and the yeah. beautiful lake. Mm -hmm. And the hotel is exquisite, actually. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I find it, you know, I hope that this time we'll, we'll make more of the fact that um, the, the Rootley Meadow is mm -hmm. opposite mm -hmm. the hotel. And this, this is a the, very. Yeah. You, you can and tell that. What's, what's the Rootley Meadow? Do you remember? There is, yeah, it's the beginning of the Switzerland, and uh, there is also the area where Wilhelm Tell uh, mm -hmm. lived. And Wilhelm Tell is the. The famous myth in Switzerland, and it's it is in this area where we will have the whole the next Odyssey. And that myth you could look at through the lens of trust and betrayal. Yeah. Because Wilhelm Tell dared to betray the foreign authorities. The oppressor. The oppressor. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so there you have it in the collective psyche. Yeah. And we have a uh, a very special person who's coming, Don Kalshit. Oh, right. yes. And uh, Robin, Robin Milo. Robin yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. so that'll be a great, uh, yeah, very special person. I met him in Ireland recently, and he's just a wonderful person yeah. to have. Very good speaker. Well, I'm looking yeah, forward Very, very deep person. Yeah. yeah. So we're starting to organize that. We're not finished with this, but we're starting to yes, organize that. Yes, it never ends, does it? Yeah. Yeah.